according to a rabbinical principle. What is not written in scripture is non-existent. The story of Jesus follows this principle. That I have come to fulfill scripture. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. Now who is Jesus? That question was asked oh, to eternity, really. But 200 years ago, a friend of Blake, on their way into dinner, said to him, Tell me, what do you think of Jesus? Who is he? And Blake replied, Jesus is the only God. But then he hastened to add, And so am I. And so are you. Unfortunately, they went into dinner, and that was the end of the conversation. So we had no further news on it. But he said, he is the only God, but so am I, and so are you. So tonight let us look at it and see how practical we can make this thing in our world. The New Testament begins with the statement that this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So the story begins with Abraham. So we go back to the story of Abraham and start with the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. And as the story unfolds, first his name is Abram, exalted father. It's changed later to Abraham, which means the father of the multitudes. So his first name is Abram, this exalted father. And we are told that the Lord spoke to Abram. And he told him that he is his shield. And that his reward will be very great. And Abram said to him, I have no offspring. You have given me no offspring. And the Lord said to him, You shall have a son. And the son will be your heir. He will not be one born of a slave in your home, but your own son will be your heir. Then he tells him, of what's going to happen to him. He will go into a land that is not his. And the offspring will go into a land that is not his. And he will be a slave there for 400 years. And when he comes out, he will be, he will inherit great possessions, very great possessions. Then we are told that Abraham believed them. And it was a comfort unto Abraham for righteousness. First he tells you, I am your shield. In the New Testament we are told, when you put on the armor of God, above all things put on the shield of faith. So we see what the shield is. And the only faith in scripture is faith in God. For well, God's name forever and forever is I am. That's God's name. That's the name of Jesus. Jesus means I am really. It's Joshua, and Joshua is Jehovah, and Jehovah is I am. That is my name forever and forever. Man finds it difficult to keep the tense, if he could only keep the tense. But he speaks of thou art and he is and all these things he can't quite believe. As Blake said to his friend, Robinson, he is the only God, but so am I. And so are you. Now we are told a tremendous sleep, a deep and profound sleep fell upon Abraham. And he slept. And then the whole thing unfolded within Abraham in the form of a dream. Now, throughout Scripture, we are told that God speaks to man in a vision. 
He makes himself known in a vision and talks to him in a dream. It would be difficult for me to tell you that this is a dream. But tonight when you do dream, you're not aware of the fact that your body sleeps. If you become aware of the fact that your body is asleep, you start to awake. So here in this so-called waking state, I am telling you this is a dream. And the dreamer is God in you, and that God is your own self, your own I am -ness. But you do not know that this is a dream, any, no, any more than you know tonight when you sleep, that your dream, in some strange, wonderful way, is to you objective and real, and you're not aware of the fact that you have a sleeping body. So in this waking state, you also have a sleeping body. But you say, this body is not asleep, it's awake. Here I am talking to you from this platform, and I'm fully conscious that I am here, and you're conscious that you are listening to me. So we seem to be completely awake. And yet I know this is a dream. I can control the dream. And you can control the dream, if you know it's a dream. The day will come, yet you will awake from it, and you will awake from the dream. When you awake from the dream, you are God, and you know you are God, only when you fully awake from the dream. I know in my own case, it was revealed to me that I will make myself known unto you in a vision, and I will speak with you in a dream. Well, he revealed himself to me as the dreamer in me. He said, I laid myself down within you to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and I knew what he was dreaming. He is dreaming that he is I. And that when he awakes, I am he. He was revealed to me as vividly as anything could be to anyone. He laid himself down within me to sleep. And in his sleep, he had a dream, and he's dreaming that he's I. Now, do I really believe it? To the extent that I believe it, I have made my world change to conform to my ideal. If I really believe it is a dream, I can dream a daydream or a night dream. But I must be in control of the dream. Now, when a man takes a state, it's a daydream, and he sees a marquee, and it reads his name, implying ownership of a certain building. It's all a dream. It's a daydream, granted. He knows exactly what he's doing. When he stands before that sign, and he sees the same sign, although no one else can see it, because it isn't there, the sign reads, F.N. Roach and Company. And he is looking at it, and he sees J.N. Goddard and Sons which would imply the Goddards own it, and they didn't have a dime. And for two years, he still is looking at that thing twice a day on the way to and the way back home. And he actually feels the thrill that would be his if what he is seeing is true. And two years later, an almost total stranger buys the building for him and takes only a piece of paper with his signature on it. For he had no money, no collateral. He said, I watch you, you and your father, and I trust you implicitly. Pay me 6% interest on the investment and reduce the principal every year for 10 years and have it all reduced in 10 years. Well, it was reduced in 10 years. And it was 6% paid to him in those days, 6% was a big return on your money. This goes back to the year 1922. And so that building became the family's building. It began as a dream. He never forgot the principle. If God does all things, well, he knows then who God is, because God did that. If by him all things are made, and without him was not anything made that was made, well, surely this came out of nothing. He had no money no collateral, no one to whom he could turn. He only desired to own that building on the main street at the corner, a wonderful corner. 
and out of the nowhere he simply assumed it and remained faithful to it and then it became his. He took that principle and applied it from that moment on to everything that he touched in this world for he discovered the creator of things in this world. For God and only God creates, is nothing but God. Well, if Jesus is the only God, but so am I, and so are you, and Jesus is the I am in every child born of woman, well then, let him begin to exercise that talent. Let him begin to test it, to prove it or disprove it. If you are faithful to it, you can't disprove it. So put on the shield of faith, you're told in the sixth chapter of Ephesians. Put on the shield of faith. It will now protect you from all the fiery darts of the wicked. If you think someone is out to get you, it's only part of your dream. You put on the shield of faith. Faith what? It's always faith in God. Well, faith in yourself. That's faith in God. For the self of man is God. And that self is Jesus. And there is no other God. If you actually test it, you can't disprove it. So here is the story of Scripture. A deep sleep fell upon him. Well, Lord, if a deep sleep fell upon him, then who is the dreamer in the sleep? He tells you it is God. He doesn't tell you that you're not going to have nightmares. You'll have nightmares and daymares because you're learning to exercise a certain power. And you make mistakes. And you think these things on the outside are external to yourself and independent of your perception of them. And they're not. They're all yourself pushed out in your bad dreams and your misuse of this power. If you are ever in control of this power, you'll have nothing but harmony on the outside. But it will come in the very end when you awake from the dream. And in the very end, you are in control of the dream because you know exactly who you are. And the whole vast world is yourself pushed out. All that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. The whole thing is yourself projected on the screen of space. So you start with a dream, a daydream. What do I want in this world? You ask yourself a very simple question. What do I want? The minute you know exactly what you want, start there. Don't look on the outside and these shadows now may uh, offend you or they may oppose what you think you want. Then you give power to these shadows. Don't give power to the shadows. Any more than he did. He didn't have one red penny to put up as collateral, but nothing. And a total stranger comes in the day of the sale of that building and with this lawyer bids for it. No one knew who the lawyer was bidding for. And when it came out at the end of the day, that this is what happened. You should have heard the remarks in the island. It didn't matter one thing to him. Now, the building opposite, a far bigger building, the most expensive building, best located and bigger area than anything on the main street, owned by someone in the family for 20, 125 years. There were absentee owners in England. And my father would stand now in his own building and look across at that building. And the name was Harrison. Harrison. His name is Goddard. But he looked at that building and he wondered, wouldn't it be wonderful if I owned it? Well, came the year 1942 and England is at war. And those who owned it, living in England, he had a son who was a priest and he had the other one who lived comfortably with all the money that they had and didn't want any part of the overseas problem and thought we should unload it. So he wrote to his uh, representative in Barbados and told him to find some family, a decent family, who makes a great effort for the island, trust themselves, and offer to them. This man comes over to my uh, brother Victor and says, Vic, how would you like to buy that building? But I love it. And to my father. My father said, I've been watching that building for years now and feeling that we own it. 
Within, I would say, one week, they cabled back to uh, England, the news came back, and we owned the building. Now, these are all dreams, but the dreams are the, in the eyes of the world are now true. These buildings are now ours, based upon the dreams of my father and my brother Victor. My other brothers didn't do it. They are sharing in the fruit, but they did not actually put it in motion. My brother Victor did. It started off as a child. In some strange way, he felt it would work this way. Why, I do not know. My father confessed years later, that's what he lived by, for he had nothing. Didn't have a nickel in this world, and really believed that his dreams would come true. Now, his name is Joseph. You're told in scripture, Joseph was the dreamer. Behold, this dreamer cometh. And so Joseph comes, the eleventh son of Jacob. And the brothers sold him into slavery, into Egypt. But he didn't care. He told his brothers when they discovered who he was, equal to Pharaoh. For he could interpret dreams and Pharaoh raised him to the point where he was equal to Pharaoh in the rulership of Egypt. And he said to them, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Take that to heart. If something appears now to go wrong, you will think, well now, it's going wrong. No, it's really going right. God meant it for good. Those who are working against you seemingly, they mean it for evil, but forget it. Don't give any power to that. You remain faithful to the vision. If I am not unfaithful to the vision, it can't go wrong. If I now move away and give power to the shadows in my world, it will go wrong. But if I know exactly what I am doing, and regardless of what seemingly is happening in my world, ignore it and remain faithful to the vision. He kept the divine vision in time of trouble. When he stood before King Agrippa, Paul said, O King, I was not forgetful, I was not unfaithful to the heavenly vision. He kept it, and then it had to come to pass. So, you are the dreamer. Now, in the Bible, when you read, your maker is your husband, the Lord of the whole earth, he is called. Well, the word translated maker also means dreamer. It also means because he has dominion over her. And people think it means a husband has dominion over a wife. It has nothing to do with that. Not dominion over another shadow. No, it's dominion over. What is the wife? This is my wife. This is my emanation. Whether it be male or female, this is my emanation. Well, emanation of whom? The emanation of the dreamer in me. Well, who is the dreamer in me? I am. Well, who is he in scripture? Jesus. Jesus is the I am of man. That's the Lord Jesus. He is God. There is no other God. So here your maker, he is the maker of this emanation, is your husband. And the word husband also means dreamer. So he is the dreamer. Well, do I have dreams? Numberless dreams. Am I faithful to the ones I really want to externalize? I hope so. I'm not always faithful, but then if I'm not faithful, then I will not externalize it. I'll bring in other things into the, into the world. But whatever I am dreaming, I will bring into my world. And I tell you from my own experience, there is nothing in this world that isn't contained within you. You think the Queen of England is something living over in London? And it's not in you? That her husband is over there? Our president is in Washington, and he's not in you. They're only shadows representing certain powers in this world. Let me share with you a dream of only a week ago. Here, I stand in the presence of the Queen, the Queen of England, the present Queen. And she said to me, Weren't you once an atheist? And I said, Not really. I did not accept the concepts that many people held of God. And if I disagreed with them concerning their concept of God, it doesn't mean that I am an atheist. No, I don't think I was ever an atheist. Not really. Save 
they would judge me as one because I did not go along with their concept of God. Then she said, do you believe in Christianity? I said, I don't have to believe in Christianity. She said, you don't have to believe in Christianity? I said, no, because I have experienced Christianity. So I don't have to believe in it. I know it. I have experienced Christianity. With that, her uncle, the Duke of Windsor, comes up, little tiny fellow, old as Methuselah, by the looks of him, and he tells her that it's time to go to the party. You're a little bit late now. And she introduces me to him. Well, he shook my hand, and I said, here is my sister, and here is her husband. So I introduced them to my sister and her husband. And that that she invited me to a certain party. I said, I'm sorry, but I can't come. When they departed, my sister reminded me that you can't refuse royalty. That that's a command. Well, I didn't tell them, but I told my sister, I do not accept any commands. As far as I am concerned, I do not accept any aristocracy in this world concerning the flesh. The only aristocracy that I will admit is the aristocracy of the spirit, and they are not born of the spirit. So here they are, they come down. A physical descent does not interest me at all. Don't tell me your physical background. For the most humble person in this world, born of woman, has a lineage that would stifle anything born of flesh. Because the most humble child in this world has a noble background that leads up to God. And God is housed in that child as that child's I amness. That's God. But to tell me that this body com comes out of a certain physical line and that that is a great line? Nonsense. So I said to my sister, it doesn't really matter. So I refused the royal invitation because I do not accept any physical lineage. I will only accept the aristocracy of the spirit and not of the flesh. I didn't tell that to the queen. But where did the whole thing take place? It took place in me. My sister, my brother-in-law, the queen, her uncle, all these are all in me. If I could only animate a section of my brain at will, the whole thing would project itself. The same scene would take place now, at this very moment. The day is coming, you will know that brain of yours is infinite. And you would actually be able to animate sections of it and see it objectify itself and have a play. And then you can stop it, and it returns well, back into you. That's where it is. You will animate another section, it will project it on the screen of space as something independent of your perception of it. And it will all act as though it's completely independent of you, and it isn't there at all. It's all in you. You stop it, where does it go? It vanishes, it returns to you. That's who you are, you're God. All things are contained within God. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. That is Jesus. And so am I. And so are you. So this is the story that I would try to get over to everyone in the world. I don't care who you are. It doesn't matter where you were born and when you were born and who you are in the eyes of people. It's what you are in your own eyes. You can start this very moment. And if you really want to transcend your present state in this world, you can transcend it. Because you're going to dream it. The whole vast world is your dream pushed out. If you didn't know it as a child, learn it now. We were the poorest people of the poor. And my brother Victor, in some strange way, he discovered that a dream comes true if you are faithful to the dream. My father told me that he always practiced it. He never went through grammar school. He, could have, he couldn't afford the penny a week to go to school. We had no free education, but a penny was a penny, and his father couldn't afford the penny. It was two cents. The British penny, a huge big coin. And so he left in what we would call the middle of a grammar school in this world. But my father had the ambition, and he had the capacity to dream. 
He was well named Joseph Nathaniel. And so he could dream all right. And he dreamed his family into being. Brought ten children into being. A lovely wife. And raised the ten and gave each financial independence when he died. And today, I couldn't tell you what they're worth. I do know that I don't think you could come and buy them out for multiple millions. And he didn't have the nickel when he started. But he had a dream. And Victor had a dream. And they dreamed. And today they're still dreaming, trying to convince the new generation who've gone to school. They all came up with their college degrees now, so they can't dream. Everything is something entirely different. If the book doesn't say so, well, then it's all, it isn't so. So, what the new generation will do, I do not know. Our generation enjoyed it fully. Now we're going to give it to the next generation. But now they're all educated. All of them who are now in the business, filling this position and that position and the other position, they have all the little IBM machines and they punch this and punch that and they'll give you all the things based upon our technology today. My father could look over the machine and see a list that long of numbers and give you the sum. Just look at it, and in one second he'll give you the sum. Push all the buttons and try to disprove it. It was what he saw. Didn't go to school? Just a little bit. And so Vic, because of lack of funds, he didn't go to well. Uh, he went one year of college, and we couldn't afford to keep him there, so we brought him back. But he knew how to dream. So what do you think of Jesus? Jesus, the only God. And so am I, and so are you. You're not less than God, because God laid himself down within you to sleep. And as he slept, he dreamed the dream. You know what he's dreaming? He is dreaming that he's you. And when he wakes, he is you. And you are God. And when you completely awake, you'll return to the garment that you laid down when you entered the shadow world. So you entered the shadow world and completely forgot the being that you were prior to your entrance into the shadow world. One day you'll awake from it and you're back in this glorious being that you are beyond the wildest dream of men. I'm telling you from my own experience, I would not encourage you with a lie. I do not have to. I'm not here to make you feel good for a moment and then let you down. I'm telling you that if you'll believe me, that you are the dreamer and you have dreamt everything into this world that is happening to you and you will continue to dream it. You can start tonight if you know exactly what you want. May I tell you, get something noble, something big that sort of fires you. See it clearly in your mind's eye and ask yourself a simple question. What would the feeling be like if it were true? What would I feel like? And then as you feel it, do it. Here is a dream. He's gone from this world now. But he was 77 when he left. He was born in Odessa, in Russia. Our Jewish family. And he knows what it is to suffer, or he knew then, to be an outcast. Not to have any new clothes at any time. Only what charity could give him. Wrapped his feet in bundles. Never knew what it was to have a suit, but slacks all patched up. And he was the head of a small family of about four. And his mother died when he was only eight. So he had to get out and earn a few pennies to bring in for food for the family. And he got a job taking money to the bank in large denominations. And they would change it into copper and silver. And he would go back to his business and give the money into the firm. And one day, looking into the face of this bearded teller, this cashier in the bank. He saw that the man gave him the copper and then the silver, and the out, outer wrapping of the copper and the silver were identical. And he wondered, wouldn't it be wonderful if he made a mistake? And so he imagined 
he made a mistake. And so he took the money from the teller, put it in his pocket, and walked back in the assumption that the man had made a mistake. He didn't make a mistake. But he walked for blocks and blocks with his patched clothes and burlap feet back to the building and gave the money back. The next day, standing before the same teller, making a similar change, the man made the mistake, and he spotted it. So he said, I wrestled with myself all the way back. Well, I had never known what it was to sit down and eat a meal and feel satisfied. I was always embarrassed with the patched clothes that I had to wear. And so I wrestled with myself, what will I do? So I went to the next bank and changed it into the right denominations for my business. That is where I work. And I kept the rest. And that night, I went all through the night resting with myself because it was not what my mother taught me. She taught me to be honest. All these things were percolating through my mind. But I, I was eight years old, and my hunger and my embarrassment got the better of me, and so I kept the money. Went out the next day and bought a pair of slacks, bought a pair of shoes, and ate until it came through my ears, and satisfied all the hungers of my body. But it taught me a lesson. It taught me that dreams do come true, but you are the dreamer. He died here about a year ago, left his widow. I introduced him to his widow, to, uh, I introduced his wife to him at my meeting. And here, he left her millions. In the interval, he gave fortunes to all charities, not to get even, no, because he made so much, he gave it. And when I've told this story, publicly in the past, they've always said to me, was that a nice thing to do? Did he ever give it back to the bank? I said, by the time that he could give it back to the bank, he would have given it back to Stalin, because Stalin took it all. Because there was no Stalin when he did it. And then by the time that he had enough money to send it back to Russia, who would he have given it to? Stalin. The very one who would naturally oppose the Jew and start the pogroms. No, he didn't send one penny back. He learned the lesson. The day is going to come, and you will know, our moral values are not God's moral values. These are all church-imposed. Has nothing to do with religion, as it's taught in the Bible. Every crime possible for man to experience is expressed in the Bible openly. It's all there. You don't have to do it. It's entirely up to you. But you're learning a principle. And you may learn it through something like that. And he learned it, and I know from my own experience with him. I've said many a time, speaking of a mutual friend, he needs some help, Joseph. And at the moment, I can't give it to him. Would you give him some money? Joseph always gave it to him. Never charge him one nickel interest. If he wanted to pay it back, perfectly all right. But he couldn't pay it back with interest. It was always an interest-free loan, if you looked upon it as a loan. And I have said it time and time to Joseph, so-and-so needs help. I think a thousand dollars will be in order at the moment. Joseph always gave him the thousand dollars. And many a time, they paid it back. And some tried to pay it back with six percent interest. He always sent the six percent back. He said, I am not a banker, I'm a friend. He never told me to give it to you. And I gave it because he told me to give it to you. But I am not here to bank. Now Joseph has gone from this world. But he left his wife this, this fortune. And she didn't have a nickel. But she too had the dream. And so she met the man who had the dream. And together they made this fortune. Because he made it before he met her. And left a lovely son. And they named him Neville. So now his name is Neville Mark. I saw him in vision. And she thought her baby would come in the end of December. And I met him. And he called me father. I said, if I'm your father, this is the month of September. I said, if I'm your father, what's your name? He said, my name is Neville Mark. I said, when are you going to come into the world? Now this is September. And I'm coming on the 10th day of November. 
I said, you're coming on the 10th of November? She said, yes. So next morning I told my wife, you're going to have a baby on the 10th of November. Well, she isn't pregnant. And she's long beyond the age where she could be pregnant, she could have a child. So she left. She said, no, you get everything you want, but this is one time you aren't going to get it. <laughs> so when I saw her in my meeting the following week, and she was a way out, I said, you know, I saw your son. She said, no, I don't want a son. I have a son. I want a girl. Joseph and I want a girl. So I said, all right, you're going to have a son. And his name is Neville, and his next name is Mark, Neville Mark. And he's going to be born on the 10th of November. So it couldn't be. The doctor tells me the end of December. So all right. Well, it was born on the 10th of November. So she called him Neville Mark. And so when he didn't behave well, I said, your name is Mark. When you behave well, it's Neville. But now you behave well, so now it's plain Neville now. From now on, it's all Neville. So I'm telling you that the dreamer in you is God. Whether you're a daydream or a night dream, that is God. Believe it. You can start right now, no matter how old you are or how uneducated you are, you can dream. And I'm giving you stories of those who were not educated who had no financial background. Joseph Burley was the man that I spoke about. You see his ads in all the fashion magazines. The Burley fashion. Well, Joseph had no financial background and no educational background. But he knew how to dream. My father, his name was Joseph too, and he didn't have any financial background or any social background or any educational background. But when he left this world in 1959, he left behind him ten children, each financially independent, through his gift. If you leave one child financially independent, that's a tremendous accomplishment. He left ten, each independently secure in the financial world. Made no discrimination between his ten, they all got the same. And that was my dreaming father. And he said to me one day, when he heard me for the first time, I told the people, close your eyes and simply see it in your mind's eye. And I began to describe exactly what I would do. After the meeting, he said to me, you know, son, everything you said today was right but one thing. I said, what? The one thing. He said, don't close your eyes completely. Leave them partly open. That's what I do. I see better. Just shut them, but don't close them completely. You lose control of your imagination. You just completely, you go away. If you leave it partly open, you can control it better. And so I would sit alone every morning and just simply shut my eyes, but I don't shut them completely. And then I see what I want to see, and I carry on conversations with those I must meet today from the premise that I want, and they only answer what I want to hear. And they completely do exactly what I want. That's how I control it. That was a waking dream. That was what my father did. That's what my brother Victor did. And they became what they are. Well, in the little island of Barbados today, they are tops in the financial world. Even the government, if they want to move, they always see my brother Victor. They've got to see him first before they make great moves in the financial world. Because he knows it backwards. So I'm telling you, it's all a dream. The whole vast world is a dream. And it's the dream of God. Now, have you heard these words? Pilate's wife sent a messenger to Pilate, saying to her husband Pilate, have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered much this day over him in a dream. I suffered over him in a dream. That was Pilate's wife sending the messenger not to have anything to do with this righteous man. Well, what is the righteous man? Abraham was the righteous man. Righteousness is simply when the individual fulfills the condition imposed upon him by a relationship he is accounted righteous. Abraham believed him. And there was accounted righteousness for Abraham. 
Well, what did he believe? He promised him a son. And before the son came into the world, when he was already 90 years, 99, and Sarah 90, he still believed that all things were possible to God. It's a beautiful story. That child was simply the foreshadowing of the coming of the Christ he knew. His name was Isaac, the laughing one. And I'm telling you, the whole story is true from beginning to end. Tell all your friends how to dream. But to dream, you must believe in God. But tell them who God is. Don't point on the outside. Tell them that God is their own wonderful human imagination. That when they say, I am, that's God. That's God's name forever and forever. Now, let them test it. You're invited by scripture to test it. Come test yourselves and see, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? If he's in me, then where is he? He can't be in my arm because I can chop it off. And I'm still a whale. He can't be in my foot. He can't be in my heart. I can take out the heart and I never transplant. So he can't be there. He can't be in a lung. Either lung, I can live with one lung. I can live with all parts being removed or cut away. But where is he then? Is my own wonderful human imagination, and you can't take that from me. That's the foundation. That's the reality. That's I am. That's God. I can dissect this body and live with parts of it gone. Arms and feet gone, and still I'm aware. But I can't cease to be when I am aware that I am. And that's the thing that actually transcends death. So you can chop off your head. You can't chop off I am. It instantly closed itself like a dream tonight. Your body's on the bed. And you aren't aware that the body is sleeping while you are dreaming. Then in what are you clothed? In my case, I sleep in the raw. But when I dream, I am always in clothes. When I stood before the queen, I was in clothes. And yet that body that night was sleeping in the raw. Because for 40 years now, I've slept in the nude. I find it easier. But here, in my dream, I'm clothed appropriately to stand before the queen. And I didn't bow before. I knew that her little so-called line, in her eyes, is a very important thing. But she was very humorous. But when her uncle came into the picture, he was of that old, old school. Very, very important. But she is queen, and he is not king. She was, he is only the uncle of the present queen. And so, if he wanted to hurry her up, she would not be hurried. She wanted to get something out of me. But who is getting it? It's myself. The whole thing is taking place within me. I'm confronted now with what is called the symbol of authority. But that's physical authority. Caesar's world. So Caesar's world stands before me. She is the queen. And when she said to me, weren't you an atheist? I said, not clearly. I didn't believe in the concepts of God that people hail, but I wouldn't call that atheism. What do you think of Christianity? Do you believe it? I said, I don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it? She said, no. I said, don't have to believe it. I know it. I have experienced Christianity. You have experienced Christianity, said she? I said, yes. Now, she is the head of the church in England, and she has an experienced Christianity. But this is all a drama taking place within me. So when the Dream came to an end, where did they go? Back into me. And I know from experience that if I could animate, stimulate the smallest little section of my brain, what it represents would push itself right out as something objective and independent of my perception of it. Stimulate it again, the same thing happens again. You can conceive of one situation in this world that isn't contained within you. Everything is within you. So there's not one being in the world that's on the outside. It's all within you. And one day you're going to completely awaken from the dream. And I'll tell you, you'll realize you haven't gone any place. You never really left your eternal home. You never died, save in your dream. I wrote those words in 1946. And not a thing has happened to me since to cause me to in any way modify it. And that experience happened to me, and I wrote that little book called The Search 
I told it in the very last page. And not a thing has happened to me to cause me for one moment to change it or in any way modify it. The whole thing is a dream. And we are the dreamers of the dream. And the day is coming that we are awakening from the dream to discover we never left our eternal home. We were never born. We were never dead. We have never died save in our dream. Seems fantastic. But I tell you, it is true. When God awakes, he awakes from a dream. So you're told in scripture, let God awake and his enemies be scattered. And when the Lord awoke, he awoke as one out of strong drink. And all the enemies were scattered. He has no enemies when he awakes. It's only in his dream that he has enemies.